So quantum mechanics is random, but that doesn't mean that it's completely unpredictable. There's a rule in quantum mechanics called the Born Rule, which lets you figure out the probability that something will happen if you do a measurement. But the thing is, that rule kind of feels tacked on. Like, there's the main equation of quantum mechanics, which is called the Schrodinger equation, and that governs all the rest of quantum mechanics. And then you have the Born Rule, which is only for the specific circumstance when you're measuring something. And it actually is tacked on. When Schrodinger came up with the Schrodinger equation, there originally was no Born rule in there, but it was added on later because people realized that that was the only way to get the correct predictions out. But is it? Is it actually necessary to add it on? In this video, I'm going to talk about a few proofs that people have come up with in the last couple of decades that show that actually you can derive the Born rule from the rest of quantum mechanics. It doesn't have to be added as an assumption. But the thing is, these proofs are honestly a little unsatisfying because they don't tell us why you had to have probability in quantum mechanics or why quantum mechanics is random or even why exactly does the functional form that the Born rule take make the most sense. It just tells us that there's no other way but the Born rule, that that is the only consistent way to assign probabilities in quantum mechanics. Still, I do think that these proofs are really valuable because it means that there's one less assumption that you have to take for granted about quantum mechanics. Plus, as a bonus, they're fairly straightforward to understand. You don't need to know all that much about quantum mechanics. So I'm gonna present the version of the proof that kind of mixes a few of them together that made the most sense for me personally. So we're going to start with the uncontroversial case, and that's where you have several options and all of them have equal probabilities. That is definitely the least interesting case, but the reason we're gonna spend some time on it is because this is going to be the key to the rest of the proof. When you have a state that doesn't have equal probabilities, what you have to do is reduce it to a form where it does. And then because we know what happens in that case, we'll be able to find the probabilities and then go back to the original case. And so this case is super important to understand. Suppose I have a electron that can be in three different energy states. So it could be an energy state A, which is the lowest, or B, or C. Now in quantum mechanics, when you have a situation like this, you're going to actually have the electron B in all three of them at the same time. So the way that we represent this is by having the state have an A component and a B component and a C component. So usually, if there's three different states that this electron could be in, it doesn't have to be in all three of them equally. It could be, for example, much more in A. And the way that we would represent that is by having a number in front of A that's sort of bigger than the number in front of B and C. But in this case, we're going to consider the example where these three numbers are going to be exactly the same. And so in other words, these three states are sort of equally represented inside of the state of the electron. I've made this number into a square root of a third, and I'll explain why for people who are curious, but if you want to skip ahead, feel free. So this is called normalization, and it's where when you take the modulus squared of each of those coefficients and you add them, that this will equal to one. Now this might seem like it is due to the Born rule because it's about probabilities, but it actually has nothing to do with probability. It's because in Schrodinger evolution, so the rest of quantum mechanics without the Born rule, you can assume that the length of every vector is one because the evolution under the Schrodinger equation will preserve that length. And so you can just like pick what length you want it to be. And for convenience, we pick it to be one. Okay, so what does the Born rule tell us in this case? Well, you have these options A, B, and C. And if you were to measure the energy, you would get one of those with some probability. But what is the probability that you will see the outcome A? The Born rule says that you take the coefficient in front of A, so that is the square root of one third, and you take the modulus square of it. The modulus square is just the same as the square in the case where all of these are real, which is what we're gonna be dealing with. So you may as well just think of this as squaring, which is the same as one third. And so that's the probability. But we didn't really need the Born rule to tell us that in this case. I mean, if we just looked at this original state, we can see that A, B, and C have exactly the same coefficients in front of them. And so whatever their probability is, all three of them ought to have exactly the same probability. We don't need to have gone via the Born rule. So this is one case where the Born rule is clearly completely unnecessary. 
But can we now use the same kind of thinking to prove that the Born rule is unnecessary for more complicated cases? Okay, so this video is sponsored by Brilliant, which I'm really pleased about because up until recently I was working for Brilliant and I really love what they do. Brilliant has some great courses on quantum mechanics, including a new course by Sabine of YouTube fame and a course on quantum computing. I should point out I wasn't involved in writing those courses, though I did contribute to some other courses that I might talk about another time. But anyway, these courses use interactives so that you can learn quantum mechanics in a really hands-on way. But Brilliant also has courses on a whole lot of other topics in math, science, and computer science. Another one I really highly recommend is a course on linear algebra because it's written by people who really know their stuff and it is a great way to learn exactly the mathematics that you need for quantum mechanics. So to get started for free, visit brilliant.org slash lookingglassuniverse and the first 200 people get 20% off their annual subscription. Yeah, Brilliant's great, go check them out. Okay, so here's a more complicated state. You have something that's a superposition of A and Z, and you can see that it's more of Z than A because this number in front of A is smaller than the number in front of Z. In fact, according to the Born rule, you would say that the probability of A is equal to taking that coefficient and squaring it, which is equal to a third. And the probability of Z is equal to taking the coefficient and getting the modular square of that, which is two thirds. So this is the outcomes according to the Born rule. But is there some way for us to completely forget about the Born rule itself and still come up with the same probabilities? The trick is to break Z down into two different states. Let's call them B and C. So this is what I mean. The original measurement was of A and Z, but you can think of Z as just being a sort of course measurement where you can't tell whether the actual outcome is B or C. So for example, imagine we're back to the original scenario where we had these three states, A, B, and C, and they represented energy levels. Z would be the state where the energy is greater than A, but we don't know whether it's B or C. So now the original state is one that says that there is some superposition of A and Z, which is itself a superposition of B and C. So another way to think of that is that the AZ measurement is when you can't get full resolution on your measurement. You want to find out what the energy of the particle is, but you're not able to figure out whether it's A, B, or C. You can only figure out if it's A or bigger than A. So the way to represent that in quantum mechanics is to write Z as a superposition state between B and C. If you're wondering why I've made the coefficient square root of one over two, that's just a normalization thing because I want this to have length one because Z is a vector of length one. And so that's the only way to do it. But now that we've rewritten Z this way, let's rewrite the entire original state in terms of this new Z. Now that I've subbed that in, let's go ahead and cancel this with those coefficients. So the twos disappear. And once we've expanded and simplified that all, we see that the original state now looks just like that state we had before, where it was an equal superposition of A, B, and C. Which makes sense because that's how we kind of designed it. We wanted to say that this superposition is the same as having this and this, which we can now break down into three parts, which is that, and that. But the really clever thing that we did was we made sure that these coefficients are going to be the same for all three of them. And so if you were to go ahead and directly measure whether the energy is A, B, or C, each of them is equally likely. But that's really useful information for us for the original measurement as well, the AZ measurement. Because imagine that I measured whether the energy is A or whether it's Z. And then if I got the result Z, I would go and do a further measurement, which was to figure out whether the energy is C or B. Then I would expect that the probabilities that I get for A, B, and C ought to be still a third, a third, and a third, because you can think of them as this state, where each of them has an equal probability. But that tells us the probability that we got Z in the first place. 
because the probability of z is equal to the probability of c plus b, and it ought to be two-thirds. So what we've just done is that we figured out the probability of z without having to assume the Born rule at all. Instead what we did was we rewrote the original state, which was not an equal probability state, and we made it into an equal probability state. From that we knew the probabilities, and then we ported them back over to the original. This was just one example of when we didn't need the Born rule, but there are actually many more examples that are very, very similar. Let's consider the case where these are the two coefficients. We're going to play the same trick of breaking both a and z into finer states, um, and then rewriting that whole thing as an equal probability state. So how many different states do you think we need to break a down into, and how many for z? We actually need to break a into two states, so I'm going to call them a1 and a2, and we need to break z into three states. The coefficients in front of a1 and a2 is 1 on square root 2, and the coefficient in front of these are 1 on square root 3. You might be wondering, am I always allowed to take a state and break it down into a state like this? The answer is yes, because what it amounts to is saying that the original measurement you were going to do, which was whether it was a or z, is actually a coarse grain measurement. And you could get a finer result by measuring whether within a, the result is a1 or a2, and within z, whether it's z1, 2, or 3. Okay, so let's substitute this state into here and this state into here and see what happens. As before, you get some cancellation. And once you shake all of those out, you get this, which is a state where there are five different options and all of them have the same coefficients. And so in other words, they all have the same probability. So the probability of all five of these is a fifth, which means that the probability of A is A1 plus A2, so it's two fifths, and Z is three fifths. And there you go, another case where you found out the probability of a and z without having to resort to the Born rule at all. This sort of trick is going to work any time that these coefficients are the square root of rational numbers. What about the much larger case where this is actually irrational? There's lots of different ways to get the irrational case to work, and all they amount to is taking the case that we've already done and extending that result to the irrational case by assuming some things about the probability function. So you might want to assume that the probability function is continuous, or maybe you want to assume that the probability function is independent of the dimension of the Hilbert space that you're working in. So whatever way you do it, you basically want to say that because we know it for this case, the function is constrained so it acts the same way, which is that you take the coefficient in front of a and you take the modulus square of that coefficient. So that's it. That's the proof of the Born rule. I know, it wasn't particularly satisfying. And whenever I find proofs like this where I can understand what happens at each line, but overall I don't feel like I really got what went on, um, I like to at least like step back and see mathematically uh, what made this proof work. And here it was really simple. Basically what made it work was the fact that we know that this function, this function that we're looking for, um, acts a certain way when these coefficients are equal. We know that what it does is it takes the modulus squared. And the reason why we know that is because, yeah, we know that that probability has to be a half. From this fact, in this very, very simple case, and using the fact that we can take any other state and basically break it down to look close to um, an equal probability state, we get the full Born rule. So there you go. You didn't have to assume the Born rule after all.